So we're back racing and normal service has resumed in more ways than one. Let's get started. Another race for the world's greatest driver, Juan Manuel Fangio. Former world champion Jim Clark leapt into the lead. That's Clark's Lotus going like a bomb. And James Hunt is the world champion by just one single point. By being a racing driver, you are under risk all the time. And if you no longer go for a gap that exists, you're no longer a racing driver. And that is Michael Schumacher ahead, the world champion. To become a four-time world champion, Sebastian Vettel, Lewis Hamilton, champion of the world. That's for all the kids out there who dream the impossible. Max Verstappen, for the first time ever, is champion of the world. Hello and welcome to episode 27 of F1 in Review, the episode and the hour where we look back at this year's Belgian Grand Prix, that being round 14 of the 2022 F1 calendar. Now this Grand Prix, unlike last year's, was bone dry and actually happened in its entirety. You'll be glad to hear for those who didn't watch the race and didn't know what's happened. I'm Tom Claiborne and I'm joined by Angus Gallagher. Unfortunately, no Tristan today. He's enjoying a well-earned week off, so any fan court fans out there, sorry but you're stuck with us, I'm afraid. And a reminder, you can follow myself and Tristan individually on Twitter, as well as the F1 in Review account, where we post these episodes once they have gone live. And for those wondering, uh, in terms of contribution to this, Tristan has written some notes for every topic, so we'll try and remember to feed those in uh, when we round off those discussions. So we've got to start with the main event of this race. Once again, Max Verstappen and Red Bull. Is there any stopping them? Because this time we see the Belgian Grand Prix being the Dutchman's third Grand Prix win on the spin. And like so many races, Max had to come all the way from P14 to win this one. He qualified top of the power granted for those who watched it on Saturday, but the engine penalty he took meant he had to pass literally the majority of the field to claim this win. A task that was largely made somewhat easy, you could argue, by the Hamilton and Alonso collision, followed by one between Latifi and Valtteri Bottas. And we saw him complaining about her, about Perez holding him up and uh, signs rolling the dice and trying the undercut when he was in P1. But Angus, for you, was there any doubt in your mind that Max wouldn't win this race after a few laps in? No, realistically. Um, there was doubt before the race that like, if the, he could win it. I thought I thought that he would like, you know, he, he's clearly very rapid. And the, what was it, seven tenths of a second advantage he had from pole position to second. That was pretty scary. But I did think, you know, it's a long race. Spa, you know, it's good for overtaking, but there's a bit more gravel runoff these days, so it's probably slightly more difficult. Um, and 14th is a bit of a steep a steep uh, drive to come through, a steep, a steep position to come through from, unless there would be like a safety car or a bit of rain. And then on lap one, some of the field decided to crash into each other. So that was nice of them. And then... Other factors such as Leclerc having that tear off in his brake duct, which meant the Verstappen gained another place. And actually, you watch the onboard back of his start. He's very, he's known for being a very aggressive and not gung ho, but a very sort of forthright driver. But his approach at the start was, I thought, very mature. He held back when he needed to. A couple of things went on ahead of him, and he just again just held back. Realised that he probably had by far the fastest car on the racetrack, so. It would. It didn't matter whether he was like P8 or P9 at the end of lap one. It wouldn't have made much difference. And in the end, it didn't because he absolutely smoked them. He absolutely destroyed the field. Um, like after a few laps, it was quite clear. Like maybe it, maybe after lap five or six, when the safety car's gone in and he's passing cars at one a lap, it's kind of like, well, he actually might win today. And then the fact that he got into the lead on lap 18 under half distance despite starting 14th, was ridiculous, really. And in the end, his winning margin of 18 seconds could have been more. He realistically has like slowed the car down to make, bring it home and make sure that you know nothing untoward happens. But yeah, it's, um, mate, dominant, like ridiculously dominant. And any hope that Ferrari may have had of clawing back this championship, I think, may have just been extinguished in those 44 laps because... 
yes, whilst the, the advantage may not be that big at every race, clearly there is an advantage. Red Bull have found something. They're talking about bringing in a chassis later on in the season to fit within the budget cap, which would be four kilograms lighter, thereby gaining about a tenth of a second a lap. So there's more to come from them possibly as well. And yeah, it looks to, it looks pretty depressing for non-Red Bull fans because one, because the car is quicker, the Red Bull car, but two, because Verstappen is just ridiculous. And I think we knew this for a while, how good he is. And now he's really starting to show like how good he really is. It's the second time this season he's taken a hat-trick of wins. Um, and this is despite the car not being the quickest in qualifying. When you have three poles, nine wins... As he does, clearly there is something within you which is ridiculously fast, and he's really unleashing that at this moment. And it's looking a very scary prospect for the rest of the field, isn't it? Absolutely, yes. And uh, Tristan said, in terms of notes for this, he kept this one very brief. He said, quote, Verstappen is now unstoppable. You've already hinted at your answer in regards to that. Do you think there's any way that Leclerc signs another car can beat Verstappen? Can his teammate do it, or is it simply his to lose unless there's huge reliability issues? The only thing that could stop Verstappen now is, like, a, like, and obviously you never want this to happen, something which would injure him, like a crash that would t- like injure him and, like, make him sit out for a few races, because then you'd have guarantee that he wouldn't be taking points in that car. But but again, he's not going to have three, four times in a row. That's, that's extremely rare. So it would have to take some untoward, like, outside circumstances, unseen circumstances, to actually give anyone a chance. Because he's so far ahead now. 93 points, and there's literally only, does quick maths, about 200 points left on the table. He He's almost like halfway to the points advance. He, he's almost halfway to the number of points which are actually left in the season. So, like, I think anyone can be ruled out of the championship now. It's only a matter of time before he manages to wrap up that second world title. And at the same time, we had Toto Wolf saying, "I reckon he could do it uh, by the end of the European section of the uh, of the of the season." Not strictly true; it's a bit of an exaggeration. But at this rate, he is definitely like looking at wrapping it up with two, three, four races to go. Such is his advantage over the rest of the field, and such is his dominance. Mm-hmm. And we're seeing the Red Bull car there uh, being so quick, so much quicker than the Ferrari as well. Uh, Chancellor Claire said in his uh, post-race conference that the Red Bull was on a different planet. And when you consider how dominant they were at Belgium, and we're going to Zanvoort next, and then we've got Monza, you know, two really strong power circuits. It's difficult to see anything but, in my view, a Red Bull victory from either Verstappen or Perez moving forwards. Because it's one of those, isn't it, where we not only see Verstappen winning this race but we also see another one two from uh, Red Bull and that's when you consider that Sainz for example had the pole position for a while was running quite a good race I don't think there was any overwhelming strategic errors from his side of the garage when it came to this race but the fact that both of them beat the Ferrari really does sort of twist the knife in the wound type thing and add salt to it particularly when you consider as well you know, Christian Horner and everyone said on the Red Bull side of the garage it's unlikely that they thought that the staff will be able to do this such was the gap or the margin he had to make up from P14 to P1. If you look at how his race has gone, 14 to first, and then you look at how the race has gone for Le- uh, for Leclerc, obviously he had some separate issues and unforeseen ones, but P15 to P6 just shows really how when your luck's up and your luck's out, they really can go in two separate directions for you. And do you see this as Ferrari missing a beat as losing an opportunity because they came out of the block so well uh, compared to Red Bull and the Red Bull powertrains. Of course, they had those issues, the Red Bull powertrains, not only the works car, but also the Alfa Tauri car. Do you think that Ferrari have failed to capitalise when they had the advantage and only have themselves to blame? Or have really Red Bull gone into a league of their own and there's nothing that Ferrari can do, irrespective of the upgrades they bring now and moving forwards? I'd say that... They haven't missed a chance because, like, the advantage they would have had to cl- they would have had to claw back anyway. I think would have been too big. They've missed a chance to be closer. I think that's the key point. But in terms of a chance to actually win the championship, not necessarily because that Red Bull car has just become supreme in recent races. There was literally there was one there was a couple of races where I mean the Silverstone. 
I mean, even at Silverstone, Verstappen looked on course to win that. But then in Austria, Leclerc passed Verstappen three times during the race. They really had the upper hand. And for a while you thought, well, actually, they could be back in this. There was talks of, you know, Leclerc being back in amongst it, back in amongst the championship fight. He'd reduced the advantage to like 40 points. And you thought, well, hang on, that's actually a chance of this going the distance. But then, <clears throat> yeah, a combination of mistakes such as Leclerc binning it in France and then other factors such as Red Bull just, well, Red Bull's pace advantage, Ferrari's strategy, blunders, many things have contributed to the gap there is, but I still think the gap would have been too large for Ferrari, for Ferrari to overhaul anyhow because it's just, Red Bull have just absolutely aced the season so far and I don't think you can argue too much against that at the moment. Stranger things have happened. But I think this would be too strange for any of this to be turned around at the moment. Yeah, I have to agree. When you consider that the gap between Verstappen and his teammate is nearly 100 points as well, and we've seen previously with Mercedes how a championship can be managed in the favour of one driver over another, it does make you think that a real raw battle for the uh, World Drivers Championship of this year is dead and buried compared to the ones gone by. And we have seen with Ferrari improvements in some regards, I think it's fair to say, from strategy. We were discussing before this that the strategic errors weren't as huge, but then again, they did still happen. And it's one of those where even after so many weeks of a summer break, and we were told there was no need for changes when it came to the Ferrari garage, but there still seems to be issues there as well, doesn't there? Which makes the gap even bigger because we saw towards the end the decision to pit Leclerc on one of the final laps to give him a chance to get the fastest lap. You know, a good idea. Gets a point back from him after, let's be fair, not one of his best weekends owing to him taking the engine penalty and then climbing only to P5 slash 6. But then the fact that they pitted him and that resulted in them releasing him into Alonso's path really and him having to fight between, uh, fight with the Spanish driver, should I say, highlights to me are they're still getting some rather basic strategic errors wrong and we saw that the earlier errors with um, Leclerc's car resulted in him getting a penalty so that resulted in him falling back anyway. Do you think that despite the huge gap we've seen in terms of the gap between Hungary and Belgium that Ferrari is still making the same mistakes as before or is that a bit too harsh? Mate I think you're being harsh on this occasion I reckon because I think that they, I think at the moment, the focus whenever Ferrari don't win anything is, oh, they must have made a strategic error. They must have done something wrong. I think that's a bit harsh on this occasion because there's mitigating factors such as the fact that, and this is an extremely bad piece of luck, to be fair. So I think that Ferrari, therefore, are even more exonerated. The fact that a tear-off, so sometimes in races you get the visor, uh, which the drivers tear off, to improve they have like two three stock on during a race they tear one off to improve their vision because it may gather like like your windscreen on your car gathers dust and dirt and other rubbish as you do a journey and one of these visors from another driver has got stuck in Leclerc's brake duct and sometimes that can end your race sometimes it can completely destroy your brakes and just render them unusable anymore but sometimes you can go into the pits and if it's noticed early enough it can be plucked out and you can carry on your merry way the irony possibly being that it may have been Verstappen's tear-off that went into the Leclerc's car, which we've had a, another level of uh, unfortunate circumstance. Um, and as a result, that has then ended up messing with the electronics on the car, which means that when Leclerc comes in for his pit stop to try and get the fastest lap, it manages to mess with the pit lane speed limiter and he goes slightly over, hence handing him a, a five-second penalty and dropping him to sixth from fifth. Admittedly, they you see that horrendous image where they've they've pitted. You see this horrendous, horrendous image on the TV where they pitted, and he's, and they've gone right. We're going to pit. And we're going to come out in front of Alonso. It's going to be perfect. And we'll get a faster slap. And he's come out behind Alonso. Of course he has, and it's just that that is the one thing maybe where I can accept. Like, come on, Ferrari. Like seriously, um, but I think the other thing, the, the rest of it. I mean, do you think... I still think it was the right decision to go for the fastest lap, right? I presume you agree. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I agree with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, like, the extra point. But at the same time, I think it is more down to bad luck to have a, a visor affect the brakes and then go into the electronics after. 
to have both those things happen in the same race is very unfortunate, I think. But but because it's Ferrari, people then go, oh, I can't. These Ferrari people, they're just unbelievable. It it maybe isn't helped by Mattia Bonotto still consistently defending anything they do, despite any possib despite the possibility that they may have made mistakes, which I get. You know, I guess you have to. I get you have to back yourself. You know, and like. And not be afraid of what the media is saying, what the people are saying behind your back, because they don't know the full picture. But like, people will prey on like any dishonesty that he may have, or any prey on anything which may seem ridiculous in public. So, I think he has to be careful of that. But in a, in a weekend where Ferrari can't really be blamed for the things which have affected them, I think that people will still latch onto it if what's happened is being defended when there was one mistake so i think that people will portray ferrari's weekend as a, as, a, as a disaster in terms of the decisions they made i don't think it's necessarily the case but they didn't help themselves at the very end that last decision kind of ruined things yeah and i suppose the pitch isn't really made that much better with the fact that signs fell from p1 to p3 despite having quite a good start and there not really being any issues when it came to his pit stop but i don't know about you but listening to the team radio of both sort of ferrari sides of the garage to their respective drivers there was a lot of questions they were asking a lot of questions to their drivers of what tires do you want when do you want to come in do you think this can last? You know, how's degradation doing? Which I understand, obviously, there's got to be some communication between uh, the pit wall and the drivers in terms of relaying information, particularly when degradation was so high, and I think everyone was suffering with that, be it Ferrari, Power, Red Bull Power, so many, so many teams, so many drivers. But it seems a real lack of confidence because you would have thought with a pit wall that has all the information there in terms of stats, data, where the drivers are, how they expect the tyres to go in terms of durability, they were asking the drivers, which are, let's remind ourselves, in the in the uh, cars that they're in, have a very limited perspective about what's going on. They're very much focused on where they are and who's behind them, who's in front of them, but don't really see the broader picture. They're essentially asking them to make the big strategic calls, which you're not seeing from Red Bull, you're not seeing from Mercedes, and I don't think you're seeing that because, as I say, the confidence is a lot higher, they've got their big decisions right, but we're seeing now a sort of a shirking of responsibility, I think, in many aspects, from aspects of the Ferrari garage, and I understand why that's being done, because, as you say, they're very much under the magnifying glass in terms of their strategic calls, in terms of what tyres they put on, when they pit their drivers, but this can only really, I think, be adding to the nervousness and, I suppose, increasing the gap, be it, I suppose, a psychological gap between Red Bull and Ferrari. But are you, are you concerned with that at all, or do you think that, realistically, we should see more constructors asking more questions of their drivers and consulting them a bit more? I think it can be, things it can be construed two ways. It can be seen as communication is, is good and that they're talking to each other and they're, like, discussing these matters. But then other people will look at it and say, well, they're completely inept. Why are they talking about it mid-race? Are they not prepared beforehand? Because, like, is I think it's not the worst thing to do in the world. But the impression it gives, and we know, we'll all know in this day and age, in this world, the optics are so important of anything. And at the moment, it looks like they're sort of, they're standing outside the the exam hall for for like their A-levels. And they just got the notes in front of them, and they're trying to remember everything just at the last minute. And all they've got like their notes written on their water bottle, and they're trying to have a quick look during the exam. But like, I think the communication is good with the drivers, but yeah, it doesn't help like that it that they're talking that way. It doesn't help that it's Ferrari that's doing this. If it was Red Bull that was doing this, you'd be like, oh, that's a bit odd, but. Like, fair enough, they're just communicating. But because it's Ferrari, everyone reacts and goes, oh, the, absolutely, like, out of their depth, what are they doing? How do they, how are they supposed to do this? Like, what are they doing? And, like, I think it, it just it just makes you think back to that moment in, fr- in France, it was, where Carlos Sainz was mid-pass, and they're trying to ask him, do you want the hards or the mediums, Carlos? And it's like, he's, he's like, <laughs> shut, shut up, I'm trying to race here. Um, but yeah, like, I don't know, I'm torn on it. It's it's not the worst thing in the world, but it just doesn't look great, does it, realistically? No, not a good look, at, not a great time for them, really. And 
I think really more questions are being asked of them now when we're seeing that Mercedes are in many aspects sort of closing the gap to them. We saw George Russell going toe to toe with Leclerc, overtaking him early on, and later on, you know, really threatening Carlos Sainz. And when you consider the huge gap between the constructors at the start of the season, the fact that Mercedes were in third place by default, not really by in terms of uh, hierarchy or quality, they were there simply because they were as simple as it may sound, far worse than Red Bull and Ferrari, but not bad enough to be sucked into the midfield pack. But, I mean, look, I mean, looking at Mercedes, you had quite a mixed weekend, in my view. You saw they were nearly two seconds off their grid-topping pace uh, to Hungary, that, that being at Spa, and you, you once again saw Toto being visibly quite glum about all this, but we've seen that so many times this season, and things have come up fairly rosy, considering what we're being told or communicated to us. But what we're seeing... For the, only the second time this season, funny enough, I was quite surprised by it. There's only one car finishing, one Mercedes car finishing the last time that happened, being at Silverstone with that huge crash between George Russell and Zhou Guan Yu. But looking at Mercedes, looking at how they're closing the gap in some aspects to Ferrari, how would you rate their weekend? Do you think they can walk away from Spa going towards Zanvoort happier than Ferrari or not so much? I don't know if they can walk away happy because all of a sudden they're 1.8 seconds off the pace again. And this is a weekend where, you know, things seem to, be, seem to be falling into place at first. Like they seemed like, you know, you had a couple of, you had a, you had a couple of cars with grid penalties as in two of their main rivals. You had a circuit, which we've talked about a few times on paper looked like it would be beneficial for them with the long straights with the the fast corners with the smoother surface you know with with spa as well being resurfaced and refurbished over the last year and you thought right this is mercedes chance chance come for pole and a double podium in hungary as well double podium in france you thought right come on this is it this is your chance Merck. this is you could get a race win here and then they were just rubbish they were just like, like the qualifying was really disappointing for them to qualify in the end, behind both the Alpines and only and George Russell in eighth was only half a tenth of a second ahead of the Williams of Albon. Don't get me wrong, Albon did a stonking performance, and we'll get onto him later. But like Mercedes, got to be doing better than that, especially if we compare it to the Williams. That's a car which has a Mercedes engine, so therefore that that half a tenth a second is literally a car aerodynamic difference which doesn't reflect well on the the main team the works mercedes team very well so i don't think they can be happy with their weekend hamilton like he's admitted afterwards he made a mistake with that collision with alonso um it's very rare we see first lap retirements for hamilton it was only his fifth one in his whole career interestingly um and strangely, three of those have been at Spa, so that's a weird, uh, weird coincidence. But yeah, yeah, exactly. But um, yeah, strange collision because there wasn't room on the outside. He went in on Alonso too hard. I'm amazed that Alonso didn't get more damage. We saw see, see how much Hamilton's car literally launched into the air, and Alonso got away with it basically with minimal car damage. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, that was Hamilton's fault. Like it was a too optimistic. He's admitted so. He apologised. So he's going to be disappointed, of course, at the weekend. But I think Russell as well, like not finishing too far off Sainz, and a good distance ahead of Alpine, as you'd expect. But Mercedes's very high expectations aren't. They don't like finishing just a couple of seconds behind Ferrari and well ahead of Alpine doesn't cut it for them. They want to be aiming for those higher places, and rightly so, after the success they've had over the last almost a decade. So, I think they'll be disappointed. I think on a circuit where it looked promising for them, they've come away with, with deadly squat, basically, in comparison to what they they want or have had in the recent races. And they're lucky that Ferrari had didn't gain too much ground on them, if we're talking about the battle for second place in the Constructors' Championship. So, like, going forward, they'd hope for a lot better. But you'd say the more and more that Red Bull looked dominant and the more and more that Mercedes looked further off than we expected, 
it looks like the chances of a race win may be dwindling. We hope not because we want that variety and we think it would be great for Formula 1 to see Mercedes. Who who knew? Who t- who would have thought that a year ago, if you told me a year ago I'd be sitting here saying, oh, it'd be great to see Mercedes win a race again. I wouldn't wouldn't have believed myself. <laughs> wouldn't have believed that I'd be saying that. But I think that we'd be we think that right now, but at the moment it doesn't look likely, does it? No, no, not at all, not at all. And I think really looking at the two next Grand Prix coming up, Zandvoort and then Monza in Italy, two very similar circuits to Belgium. And when you consider that their forte seems to be at street circuits versus power circuits, look at how well the Jet Hungary in terms of pace there versus Belgium, I think you can say with some confidence that they're unlikely to be getting their first race win at either Zandvoort or Italy. I think they could have a chance in Singapore, for example, looking further towards the end of the calendar, somewhere like maybe Mexico, they could have a chance as well. But they're running out of options, really, or opportunities, in my view, where they could go and get their first race win. And I refer everyone back to my previous comments where I would still be shocked, really, if Mercedes don't win a race because we've seen previously in so many seasons and series and years of Formula One, there's always been one or two races where there's just been a complete shock. So... Yeah, take Monza for example, where Daniel Ricciardo won that one, where Esteban Ocon won a race as well. There's always one where someone just comes a bolt from the blue and wins a race, and we're yet to have that really, which makes me think: Are we due that? Come, you know, the next few races towards the end, or is it going to be a, a year of Formula One similar to the Vettel-dominated years with Red Bull, where ultimately we just see the predictable happen week in, week out, with very few exceptions, really. But it's been a weird weekend for Mercedes because I think the best way to describe it for me personally would be they've salvaged it because Saturday, as you said, was pretty awful. P7 and P8 finishing just above a Williams is really harking back to how they started off this season, really. And we know how disappointed they were with that and how everyone was really there. So the fact that they were able to go and get George Russell finishing so highly in terms of the fact that he finished P4 and was knocking on the door of the podium is testimony really to how well Mercedes have done in terms of turning really poor qualifying days around and converting that fairly well in terms of in terms of races but I, I have to agree when it comes to your views on the Hamilton Alonso collision that it was very uncharacteristic of him to be quite naive really there because there was no doubt that it was his fault he admitted to it but yeah, the reaction of Alonso, him blasting down the radio, what an idiot, this guy only knows how to drive and start in first, <laughs> really shows that there is no love loss between those two after so many years of calling off and being in separate teams. But um, yeah, I was impressed really by the pace of Alpine, uh, Alonso and Ocon, Ocon doing two double overtakes. That was you know, quite remarkable, really. And you look at the Grand Prix coming up the circuits there, and you think Alpine, if they get their ducks in a row, really could have a very good weekend. And I think maybe could even get on the podium and beat Mercedes pound for pound if everything goes their way. But we'll see in that regard. But, um, but yes, an interesting one for Mercedes. They're closing the gap to Ferrari, but I feel that Ferrari are sinking back more to their level, more than Mercedes are propelling themselves forward to joining, I suppose, the big two at the moment. I still do believe that them not getting a race win would, would be disappointing, really. And um, I suppose we're looking once again at someone like George Russell doing so well in terms of a P4. No, he's finished, once again, no lower than P5 incredibly consistent season from him so I think if anyone's deserving really of some luck to get on the top step of that podium it would be him in my view but um we'll see Mercedes have had the rub of the green so far in terms of being able to salvage really poor weekends compare this to Ferrari for example where they've had to take penalties or things haven't gone their way and it just shows that it's almost lost isn't it the, the luck that's it plays so crucial in Formula 1 versus who has the best kit, really. But, um, yeah, do you think that Mercedes could go on to win a race this season? Do you think that they have ultimately missed their opportunity in races gone by at somewhere like Hungary, or do they still have a chance in some of the more street circuit orientated ones to come? I was thinking about this as just as you were talking. I think that the thing with Mercedes is, is this is a pretty damning assessment that I can give, is that in my opinion now, with the pace advantage that other teams seem to have, and Mercedes, the sh- I think it's just a shock that they had at not being as high up the field as they wanted to be. 
I think I could think there's a case for arguing that there is more chance of like a of a, there is more chance of a freak result leading to a team outside the top three winning than there is or there's as much of a chance I'd say as one of someone outside the top three winning through a freak result than there is of win, Mercedes winning a race on merit. I think I think Mercedes winning a race on merit would almost be considered a freak result, and I think that it's one of those where. It's like how last year you had Valtteri Bottas didn't win a race until like Turkey and he won a race after Ocon and Ricardo did. So Alpine and McLaren both managed to win a race before Bottas did. And I think you could feasibly say this year there is more chance of an Alpine or a McLaren winning a race via a freak of nature than Mercedes winning a race by being the fastest. Now of course Mercedes could win said freak race but I think the fact that I've said that and the fact that I think the Mercedes don't have much of a window of opportunity back to being at the front of the field I think is the most damning assessment I can give them um, in terms of whether they've missed their chance uh, hard to say because they've not really had a chance to miss there's been little pockets haven't there where for example in Spain when Russell led for a bit and basically got outpaced you know and then in Hungary, where he was quick, was on pole, but he got outpaced. All the couple of races where Hamilton came second, he was like solid. I remember in France, he was solidly behind Verstappen for a while. Or at Silverstone, where at the end, he was on the fresh tyres and there was the hope he could win, but it didn't materialise. So there hasn't been a concrete chance where you think, right, they've really like not taken that opportunity. So they they haven't really had a chance to miss, realistically. And... Will they get a chance to take or miss later on this season? I I don't know. I feel like a I feel like a broken record saying it, but yeah, I don't think that Mercedes are looking good in terms of getting a race win. But I, I don't know. You know, you never know. But then also there's the, there's the point of I think soon enough, if not already, they'll have just ditched this car and moved on to the 2023 car in the hope of making that the contender they want it to be. I mean, Toto Wolff has been quoted as saying that. The Mercedes car from this year, it won't be put in the highest parts of the museum in Stuttgart, the Mercedes Museum. He he said, he said they'll probably put it in the caves if possible. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I think the season, the longer it goes on, the more and more it's becoming a write-off for Mercedes. If it hasn't done already. Mm. And I think of opportunities to come. I look at someone like Alpine and think the next two races and perhaps you know someone like the US could really be a chance for them to... Well, there's no chance of them beating Mercedes, I don't think, because they've got to they've got a, de- a deficit of over uh, double to overcome, which just isn't going to happen. But I think they could really solidify their fourth place currently over McLaren because McLaren have looked uninspiring. I think it's fair to say when it comes to uh, the power circuit so far. I mean, looking at this Grand Prix, for example, you had neither of them finishing in the points. Norris in P12. You've got Daniel Ricciardo being quoted as looking like a broken man by some commentators, and he was down in P15. Things aren't looking too hot for them, I don't think it's fair to say. Meanwhile, you've got Alpine, which, yes, you've got Alonso moving on, but a P5 for him, a P7 for Ocon, the double overtake there. And when you consider that Alonso was able to go and get this after, you know, I think it's fair to say some damage at the very least to his car is a testimony to how good he can be and the quality he has moving forwards. He's quoted as saying that Aston Martin will get the best Fernando Alonso ever, which I take with a pinch of salt, but he's at least showing now at least that he has the ability to go toe-to-toe with some of the best races on the circuit and, and do very well. He was battling Charles Leclerc there towards the end, which shows that in terms of the power circuits, the Alpine can take the fight to Ferrari. He took the fight very much to uh, Lewis Hamilton and Mercedes. And yes, he wasn't able to overtake George Russell, but he was not no slouch in comparison to him. So if I was Alpine, I'd be looking at the next two races and thinking this could be a real chance for us to get on the podium, which when you consider the mixed bag they've had so far in terms of so many retirements uh, in some in some areas and the fact that they've finished no higher than P5, do you think that they could get themselves onto the podium or is that... Uh, the freak incident of Formula One 2022 that we're perhaps hoping for, the one that's yet to come. Alpine can get themselves on the podium, I think. I mean, they got themselves on the podium last year in a weaker car. I think the fact that we've seen 
Alonso and to a certain extent Ocon performed strongly so far this year means that there's definitely you know a chance that they could get that podium if I compare it to last year Alpine got in the 2021 season, he got 155 points across the season, which is pretty good, in 22 races. And this year, they got 115 after 14 of 22 races. So you can say they're almost on, they're probably on track to beat last season's target. And last season, of course, they got that victory in Hungary and uh, Alonso's podium in Qatar. So the chances of them having a strong finish and getting some more points on the board getting some more points which would enable them to you know stretch their leader over McLaren who you're right I think look a bit a bit drab at the moment I think Ricardo's announcement that he's left is kind of like whether that'll give him a lease of life at the end of the season I think it'll get it'll be the opposite I think that he will it could easily just make him get completely demotivated it can be like we've all had sometimes where we know we're leaving a job and for the last period before we leave that job we're sort of like a bit demotivated you think i'm not going to work for this company again it doesn't mean that you don't want to try hard but you still would but it just doesn't translate into what you would necessarily want you know um and also the fact that their car is definitely looking slower than alpine's alpine look more likely to challenge mercedes than they do to be sucked in by mclaren or anyone else behind so you know that means that you think there's definitely chances for Alpine to get on the podium. I mean, they've only had, I say only, they've had a highest finish of fifth so far this season, which has got, they got three times. And you'd say that there's a chance for them to improve on that realistically. You often get the odd late season race where something happens or a strange result comes out of nowhere or it's like something can occur. Like we saw at, at last season at Jeddah, I think it was, when Ocon came fourth. I think yeah, he came fourth and he was like beaten on the line by Bottas, but it was it was a bit of a strange race. There were a few incidents, but he kept himself in and around the top placings, and he managed to get fourth in the end. So you never know; it could be the odd race where, like, like I describe as a freak race, where maybe we're going back to Singapore. Maybe that's like the, it's the first time we've been there in three years. Maybe the like driver, maybe everyone, maybe everyone crashes. I don't want to put it like that, but maybe like we have a instant filled one or somewhere like Suzuka where sometimes you get a bit of rain maybe that would be a a race where you could throw something up so i think there's a chance of getting a podium definitely also because alonso definitely and ocon to a certain extent are on form as shown by the last race ocon's come from 16th to 7th alonso realistically was going to finish no higher than fifth anyway despite that collision but it's a good placing for a 41 year old man so you know chances are yeah podium could be in their sights you know yeah I, I think you're absolutely right there and i think if it's someone like oscar piastri yes next year's car is going to be rather different but i think he's probably looking at the tweet you put out of i will not be racing for alpine and thinking boy if i could turn back time because they look like they've got the beating of mclaren at the moment i mean everything could change moving forwards but i for one and i know you certainly didn't angus expect them to be this high in terms of how they've done so far they look you know really well suited to the power circuit which i just didn't see coming i thought they would be behind mclaren i thought looking at the start of the season that some of the ferrari cars for example looking at alfa romeo and bosses they perhaps would have the beating of at least one of the alpines but um yeah they're building towards something i think and when you consider as you say there when you look at the end of various different seasons of Formula 1, you do have the odd freak result. I'm reminded, for example, of Yuki Tsunoda getting P4 in Abu Dhabi. Yes, that was a hugely chaotic race with that safety car. Uh, you know what I mean. Uh, last season, playing a huge sort of hand in that, really. But it just shows that there can be things uh, to play for and there can be opportunities that spring up out of nowhere, really. But I think a P4 finish for Alpine would be above expectations at least for me and I think realistically speaking for them um, oh, and just reminding everyone of Tristan's comments I realise I've not filled you in with that he said in terms of Ferrari they're a bit of a joke at the moment um, not only failed to get a faster slap but nearly lost their place to Alonso and in fact I suppose they did when it came to the penalty they got for speeding or Leclerc should I say for speeding in the pit lane and Mercedes in regards to them he said out of nowhere they were surprisingly bad I was shocked by Hamilton's mistake 
I think we all were in that regard, but he handled it very well and admitted he was at fault, which to be fair, he did in many, many regards. He came out very bluntly and said, yep, it's my fault, fair play. Um, so respect to him for that. Now, I suppose looking slightly further down the grid, we spoke last episode, didn't we, about Sebastian Vettel, Pierre Gasly, Alex Albon, featured very heavily. That was part two of our mid-season drivers review if you didn't uh, listen to that do of course find that on your podcast provider of choice and have listened to part one if you've not listened to that either we basically ranked all of the drivers in terms of uh, a number out of 10 how well they've done so far started from the top of the leaderboard and went all the way to the bottom but we saw Seb Vettel getting points we saw Pierre Gasly getting points Alex Albon getting points finishing respectively in P8, 9 and 10 We had a lot to say about them, a lot of positives, a lot of negatives, but have any of them changed your mind about them? Have they surpassed expectation? Do you think these points could be valuable for them in their own respective championship and also for the constructors, or is there a long way to go for all of them? My mind has been changed on Gasly, I'd say, after the season he had, because I, this completely, for some reason, completely, uh, like, passed me by. Only until I looked at the, the race classification just before we came on. He started in the pit lane. I completely forgot about that. He obviously qualified in 12th. And then that led to, with the penalties working their way, how they did. A starting position of 8th. And I remember thinking, oh, 8th to 9th. That's pretty good. Alpha Tauri's not been quick recently. But he started in the pit lane. And I was like, oh my goodness. Like Actually, that's a hell of a result, realistically. For a car which... Hasn't scored points since Baku before that race. That was the first time in six races they'd scored any points at all. They have, and they still do have, to be fair, Aston Martin breathing down their neck with an Aston Martin car having got points in seven out of the last eight races compared to an Alpha Tauri car getting points in two out of the last eight. It shows you that that's actually a brilliant result for Gasly. And it's a bit of the old Gasly, you know, the old Gasly who would really fight the car and really dig out a good result when well when there was a good car or whether there was whether there wasn't a good car so fair play to him that's changed my opinion on him a little bit and given him a strong a strong thumbs up from me not that means anything he probably doesn't listen to my opinion but still is i give give him a thumbs up vessel as well vessel had a strong weekend didn't he he was like in the again his like with gas same with gasly their car wasn't really suited to the higher echelons of the points but they managed to get themselves into the points Vettel especially managing to hold his own early on had a good start you know showed his wily old self got up to fifth at the end of the first lap despite starting 10th so again you know it's a case of he had a he had a good weekend in the end got some good points Aston Martin in that you know the battle for eighth which I don't is the battle for eighth when there's ten teams? Is that really is that really a thing? It is apparently, but the battle for seventh realistically because Haas are being sucked into it. But yeah, that was a, a good result for Aston Martin. Um, Alex Albon, my opinion, ain't changed on him. You you can see that performance coming. He's like had a very good season, like I alluded to in the mid-season review last week in our second part of that, and his qualifying was brilliant. I thought that. The fact that Latifi had gone out in Q1 and Albon made it to Q3 really speaks volumes for how good of a performance Albon had. Because realistically, where Latifi qualified 17th before the grid penalties, this is, is a fair representation of where Williams have been this season at, at many points. So for Albon to qualify then 14th, 15th, 16th would have been, been expected based on that. But for him to drag it into the top 10... Qualified ahead of Lando Norris, who admittedly had a grid penalty, so he might not have been giving it full beans. But it was a brilliant result for Albon. It, in the end, meant a starting position of sixth, which is like, hope hope that he wasn't getting too dizzy up there. You know, it's giddy heights for those those Williams boys and girls. Um, but no, for real, like a brilliant performance. And for him to, again, maintain that position in a race where he's finished ahead of Aston Martin, who've looked better recently, Ahead of a McLaren, who are definitely better than them. And also the second Alpha Tauri and Sonoda. Those are the three cars closest to him. And that meant that it ended up being a very good weekend for Albon, which, again, I'm not surprised personally, because I think he's had a great season. And 
it was just a case of obviously he hadn't had points since Miami, but that's a difficult car to drive that Williams. So, and they are going to finish last in the constructors. So, unless some freak event happens, so the odd point here and there will be beneficial for them. Did your opinions change on any of them? Do you reckon after these results, these point scores that these three managed to achieve? Oh, well, I think that Seb Vettel once again showed that while he's gracefully departing from the sport, he's hardly lost his edge in terms of navigating what is, let's be fair, not the best car on the grid to a good points finish. Yes, he qualified in P10, and that was helped by the penalties that different uh, cars had. But still, you've got to convert that and to get that above an Alfa Tauri, I think, is an achievement in itself. To get that above, uh, well, two Alfa Tauris, actually, for that matter, two McLarens, and Anne and Alfa Romeo as well. I mean, that's no mean feat, is it really? So I wouldn't say my opinion had changed on Vettel, but he's reminded us all how good he still is and how valuable I think he is moving forwards for Aston Martin, at least for the remainder of the season. Because you're totally right. Seventh place is up for grabs, really. Haas could easily get sucked down into this and get sucked all the way down to P9. There could be a real sort of, you know, rotation of P7, 8 and 9, that being Haas, Alpha Tauri and Aston Martin at the moment. So really all to play for there. Um, I mean, Gasly, I think, well, I've had a bit of a reflection on this and I was a bit critical of him last race. I thought they hadn't really done enough to wow other constructors and show them why he deserved to break away from the Red Bull Academy which he still is constrained to in my view I think it's no secret that he's not going to get a chance in the Red Bull Works team anytime soon so his best hope is that either A. Alpha Tauri produce an absolute barnstorming car which they haven't done this season and I don't think they'd like to in the future or he breaks that and goes out to another team and I think this performance with him finishing uh, in P9 really does show to Alpine which the rumours say he is on their short list if the Piastri situation goes south for them. For those who don't know, we're recording on Monday when they're meeting regarding uh, their meeting with the respective contract board and we should find out fairly soon or we'll get at least a hint of how that decision will go in terms of whether Alpine are in the right saying that Oscar Piastri is their driver or whether Piastri has a case saying actually no, uh, I have the freedom to go elsewhere. <coughs> Cough McLaren. Um, but yes, I think that Gasly is showing his worth and I think he'd be a valuable asset really to um, Alpine moving forward. He would be a good replacement, I think, to uh, Fernando Alonso. You can't really compare the two because obviously one is a wily old campaigner and has so much experience and, as we're seeing, is still very much at the top of his game and compare him to Pierre Gasly I think he's in his prime or going into his prime but he's reminded us really of how good he is um but my views on Albon like yours haven't really been changed at all by this race in fact they've well, been enriched I guess similar to my views on Vettel because as you say the gulf really between Alex Albon and Latifi a shows that Alex Albon is a cracking driver and deserves to be in a better car and is integral to all good things that are happening at Williams this season, albeit a fairly limited list of good things. And that B, Latifi just isn't really cutting the mustard. It's nothing personal of sorts. You know, he brings in a lot of money and sponsorship for the team, but if Williams are serious about progressing from the foot of the table and not receiving the wooden spoon every single year, they need to get someone on uh, Albon's uh, level, I suppose, and get a similar driver to him who can pull that car up kicking and screaming. Because I looked at the sort of classification for this race and went, all right, you know, points for Williams, one point, but it's a point nonetheless. And then I looked above and saw Alfa Tauri, Aston Martin, all the competitors around them getting points. So it's almost like for them, Williams, it's one step forward and then three or four steps back, isn't it, unfortunately? But um, it's like they're sort of racing with one arm tied behind their back. But there's reasons to be cheerful if they're able to do this well at a power circuit. You've got two more coming up, as we alluded to, moving forwards in uh, Zanvor and Monza. There's reasons to be cheerful there. But um, yeah, all to play for when it comes to the midfield. It's just such a shame, isn't it, that once again we're looking further down the constructors and drive the championship because it seems that the top of it is completely sewn up. But hey, you know, it looks fairly competitive down the bottom. We're seeing the regulation changes working wonders in many capacities insofar that it's so competitive down there. Um, they can race so much closer than before and it really is anyone's game moving forwards. But um, I think, yeah, there's going to be a big few races coming up for Haas because... 
they've looked pretty uninspiring recently. You look at their last three races, that being France, Hungary, and now Belgium, they've scored points in none of that. None of that at all. And we spoke last episode about how Mick Schumacher in particular needs to go and up his game. And now he needs to go and show his worth, really, because you've got Ricardo without a car next year. He's apparently been in contact with a number of teams. Apparently, Good to Stein has spoken to him before he made the announcement that he'd be leaving McLaren at Hungary. So, all to play for, really, for Mick Schumacher moving forwards. But then again, all to play for for Haas as well, because they need to go and show someone like Daniel Ricciardo that they are worthy of his time, because I don't think he's going to be somebody who's going to settle for anything. An interesting few races to come up, really, when we're looking at Zanvoort and Italy as well. But um, I think just such a shame for Williams, isn't it, really? But um, nice to see, at least, that... Seb Vettel is redeeming himself and Pierre Gasly is showing the form of all. I'm just looking at someone like Sonoda and going, time for you to go and join the party, fella. Because once again, no points for him. P16 in the Drivers' Championship. We know he's talented, but he needs to go and show that similar to Mick Schumacher, in my view. Yeah, I think with Sonoda, he's with Gasly having a really strong weekend there. Sonoda's been put under the microscope a little bit. Again, I think that we kind of alluded to this in our mid-season review episodes, but he had a bit. He had a strong-ish start to the season. It was looking like he closed the gap to Gasly. Was pumping out some good results, and then it's kind of all gone a bit back to what it was, and how the fact that he wasn't like the previous time when he wasn't producing too many good performances, he would find himself further down the pecking order. He wouldn't be, and I, I almost think that. It seemed to. It looked worse last year when Gasly was in. Was like delivering results out of that car when Gasly was getting like top six, top seven, and you had Sonoda trundling around in about thirteenth, fourteenth in the same car. But now the fact that the car is worse means that Gasly's highs aren't as well documented, and therefore it looks better for Sonoda. But yeah, in recent races, Gasly stepped it up, and Sonoda has looked more and more like the old version that he used to be and again this prodigious talent that Red Bull and Helmut Marco see um, I don't see it personally but you know it's something which he'll have to <clears throat> pretty quickly turn round and turn in his favour because yeah a poor weekend from him and you've also got I mean the one saving grace for him I suppose in all of this is that if you look at Formula 2, and Red Bull have a, a large amount of junior drivers in Formula 2 at the moment, once again, none of them are like really standing out massively. Liam Lawson did drive in FP1 in the Alpha Tauri um, on the weekend, and he did win the sprint race. But at the same time, <clears throat> not standing out massively, not doing anything, not sticking his hand up and grabbing the the drive by the scruff of the neck and saying yes i want i want to drive this car you should pick me absolutely so that may once again be his saving grace maybe the thing that saves sonoda but yeah looking like another interesting weekend an interesting not in a good sense i mean um from his side yeah absolutely and i think that's highlighted even further by not only pierre gasly starting in the pit lane but we also read he was 90 seconds away from not even racing because of electrical problems with his car and the car wouldn't even switch on so literally all those obstacles being thrown at him and there he is finishing in p9 versus sonoda which had who had a smoother weekend i think it's fair to say finishing in p13 now i suppose there's nothing inherently wrong with that when you consider that a ton like lando norris was only one point ahead of him but you do expect a bit more of him because we know the talent's there where there was a lot of faith uh, placed in him with the fact that he was uh, pushed into formula one and uh, replaced daniel kvyat immediately after winning F- uh, f2 but in my view it's not really paying off or it's not really paying dividends so far and i think looking forwards to the second half of this season he's somebody who's got a really big point to prove I suppose the only saving grace for him or one of the saving graces for him is when you look at the fact that he scored points on three occasions so far this season and the points have been at different racetracks i.e. not just power circuits but also street circuits we've got Spain in there we've got Bahrain we've also got uh, Imola as well 
it's he's not in a situation where he's going into Zandvoort or going to, into Monza thinking, well, this is one of the only chances I've got because the car is only seated to a power circuit, for example. Pierre Gasly's shown it is very much seated to a power circuit of sorts, but I suppose looking at the track record of AlphaTauri, they can get points elsewhere. So the gig isn't up, but I think you know the door is closing in many aspects because when you consider that, well, in terms of races left, there are eight. You've you've got to think to yourself. You've got to start getting some points now, otherwise the question marks just get bigger and bigger. Um, but as you say, he is helped by the fact that there is no Sonoda 2.0 for Helmut Marco and Co. To say right, so you can have a go. So you know he's got time to bed himself in, but there will come a point, won't there, where another Sonoda appears, someone else in Formula Two bursts up the block, uh, and is of the Red Bull Academy. So hopefully this will be a season anomaly in, in so far that this will be. A quite an underwhelming one, but this can't be the norm really if Yuki Tsunoda wants to one day get into the Red Bull Works team and wants to really show um, Alpha Tower and the Red Bull Academy more generally why they were right to put him in their car. So yes, as we've been hinting to throughout this episode, round 15, the Dutch Grand Prix at Zandvoort kicks off at the end of this week. It's a power circuit as we know, so in my view I'm looking at someone like Red Bull, unsurprisingly, Alpine, unsurprisingly, and perhaps Ferrari in thinking... They could be in for a good weekend if all things go right in their direction. We had uh, engine penalties being taken by Ferrari and Red Bull, so we're looking at a more, I suppose, traditional grid for the start of Sunday. And I'm looking, I suppose, on the other side of the coin at Mercedes, at Haas and McLaren, and thinking this could be a weekend to forget or one where they've just got to accept they won't be getting bucket loads of points at least but um that's my snapshot of what's to come at Zanvoort what about you Angus do you largely agree with that or not so much yeah I'd say I agree overall with that um in terms of yeah a more traditional grid and also one one memory I have from last year at Zanvoort was around the return of the race after no Dutch Grand Prix for 36 36 years or something like that and the fact that for the first time ever there was a competitive Dutch driver who was at the front of the field in Formula One, and it really led to like a party atmosphere, helped by the fact that Verstappen smoked the rest of the field and won quite comfortably in the end. But I think that's the point. He did win quite comfortably, and it didn't lead to a very interesting race, and one where it was a race where overtaking was tricky, shall we say. So I think this we we to- spoke earlier in the season a lot about tests of the new regulations and the new um, cars and their ability to follow each other I think this will be another one this weekend because if it was to follow the previous years and follow form it would be another race with lack of overtaking but we'll have to see if that was the case I was taken aback because I was looking at last year's Dutch Grand Prix and I saw that Antonio Giovinazzi qualified in 7th how? I, I, I do not remember that happening but that is quite incredible um, it must be fact it's written in front of me, so you know. Um, but yeah, I think it could be interesting to see. I've definitely switched lots of people off there by saying it's going to be a boring race, but stick with it. Trans me, stick with it. It could be a very interesting race. Um, especially if, I know I said this about Spa and it didn't turn out to be the case, but I've looked at the weather forecast for Zandvoort, Netherlands, and scattered showers are on the menu for both Saturday and Sunday. So it definitely won't rain now after I've said that. But we can dream. We can dream. Um, but yeah, it'll be interesting to see. I feel like Max will win again. He could dominate again. I feel like the home crowd, a bit like how Hamilton at Silverstone is spurred on by the the British fans, the Dutch fans, the Max Verstappen arm, the Orange Army could drive Verstappen on to another victory. But we will see. It's a quick turnaround. And that can work two ways for someone like Ferrari or Mercedes. It can either be the pain is compounded and their inconsistency or fallacies from the previous race is like added to. Or it could be a perfect opportunity to put the previous weekend behind and immediately make amends. So it'll be interesting to see which of those two ways it will go as well. But yeah, looking forward to it. 
And it seems that's all we got time for in terms of episode 27 of F1 in Review. Thank you very much for listening all the way to the end of this episode where we reviewed a rather different Belgian Grand Prix 2022 to the one we had last year, lest we forget. Thank you very much for tuning in, be that on your preferred podcast provider or whether you've listened live or via the Listen Back feature on River Radio. Qualifying starts at 2pm on Saturday, that's British Summertime. And the race is 2pm as well on the Sunday, British Summertime. And we look forward to reviewing the highs, lows, the questions and what's to come really of this season, next season and everything in between. But thank you very much for listening and we'll see you this time next week. Bye bye.